Hello, hello. How is everyone this beautiful day? We are here tonight with David Moranis and the Bob Parks to talk about Jim Thorpe, who was possibly the greatest American athlete of all time. In addition to being the first native to win Olympic gold, he also played football and baseball professionally. So what is your favorite sport? And do you think that he was the GOAT? So we're just asking what is everybody's favorite sport and if they think that um, Jim Thorpe was the GOAT or if they have another favorite choice. So. All right, then I'm going to go ahead and introduce um, uh, David and Bob. Uh, David Marinus is the New York Times bestselling author of 13 books, a fellow of the Society of American Historians, and a visiting distinguished professor at Vanderbilt. He has been affiliated with the Washington Post for more than 40 years as an editor and a writer, and has twice won the Pulitzer Prize at the paper. In 1993, he received the Pulitzer Prize for national reporting of the coverage of Bill Clinton. And in 2007, he was part of a team that won the Pulitzer for the coverage of the Virginia Tech shooting. He was also a Pulitzer finalist three other times, including for one of his books, They Marched Into Sunlight. He and his wife, Linda, who is a retired environmentalist, live in Washington, D.C. and Madison, Wisconsin. Bob Parks is a curriculum developer at MIT in Boston. He is also a freelance writer who specializes in the long form stories on inventors, designs, and energy innovations for Bloomsburg, Business Week, Wired, and Make. He loves to run and he finished the Boston Marathon in 2014 in two hours and 50 more minutes. He lives in Brattleboro with his wife and their son and daughter. And he is also the president of the Literary. Welcome, David and Bob. Thanks thank so you. much, Sandy. And thank you, David, for, uh, for uh, joining us this afternoon. Um, uh, delighted to be here, if only virtually. <laughs> what a wonderful book. What a, well, what a saga, you know, um, just something to really seek, sink your teeth in. It's, uh, as we'll discuss, uh, there's an aspect of sports for all sports lovers, but there's a deeper... Um, theme of the Native American experience. Um, for those um, who need a refresher on what an incredible athlete we're talking about, there's no hyperbole in saying that he may be the best uh, American athlete of all time. Um, and uh, what are some of those uh, hallmarks that establish that record? Um, well, nobody has did or has done what Jim Thorpe did. Um, I mean, there are a lot of great all around athletes, but he had the trifecta of being a, an Olympic gold medalist in the decathlon and the pentathlon, which are the two big all around events. He was also an all American football player at the Carlisle Indian Industrial School. Um, the first great player in professional football, the first president of what would become the National Football League, and a Major League Baseball player. So that trifecta has never been accomplished before or since. Um, you know, he was also, he was good at hockey. He was a good swimmer. He was good at marbles. He was even a, a great <laughs> ballroom dancer. So there was real, literally nothing that Jim Thorpe could not do athletically. Uh, let's start with uh, the the, the uh, decathlon and pentathlon. Um, that's an incredible uh, feat for America and for Jim Thorpe. And um, as we'll see, it was clouded by the the uh, problems of malfeasance and cover your ass uh, kind of shenanigans of people close to him who, who betrayed him. But for now, let's talk about this incredible thing. Maybe I'll just put up a picture uh, from that day and you can describe to me what is happening in this picture. There he is, Jim Thorpe. You know, it's an incredible picture and um, a zoom in of that is the cover of my book. But when you zoom out, you see this entire majestic, athletic, electric, uh, charismatic 
um, at ease athlete. Um, this is in the middle of his uh, decathlon events. When you look down uh, at his shoes, you see he is wearing mismatched shoes. They were different sizes because earlier that day, uh, the mythology is that they were stolen. I think he just couldn't find them. And he had to sort of get some makeshift shoes to compete. Uh, one shoe was bigger than the other. So he had to wear a couple of pairs of socks on one of the feet to make it work. And then Bob, he went out and won the high jump, <laughs> you know, with those mismatched shoes um, on his way to um, a, just a majestic uh, performance in the decathlon. As you know, decathlon scoring has changed over the years, as have so many different parts about athletics in terms of training and diet. And so it's really difficult to compare athletes from different generations. But what Jim Dorp, what Jim Thorpe did in that decathlon is he beat his opponents by a, a larger margin than any time before or since. Um, he competed in 17 events in two weeks. Uh, you know, the 15 of the decathlon and pentathlon plus the long jump and the high jump. So, uh, you know, it was he he ended that two week period. Um, getting those two Olympic gold medals and being declared by King Gustav of Sweden as you, sir, are the greatest athlete in the world, which he definitely was. What is he, uh, early early 20s in that photo? He's 25. Wow. Uh, yeah, and it's sort of at the peak. I think 25, 26, 27 are often considered the peak years of, of any athlete's life, and he was right there. And to me, the whole shoe uh, issue of um, just trying to find a, a pair of shoes that work uh, <laughs> speaks to his um, quality of being unflappable and that he, in football as well, he would walk onto the field and did he, did he have a lot of nerves? Did he have, a, uh, he just, he just seemed confident uh, from what you describe in the book. You know, from everything that I can tell from all of the interviews that I've seen and uh, uncovered in researching this book, he had a coolness about him, uh, an equanimity. Uh, you know, he, he was definitely not afraid in football. Um, he rarely got hurt. Um, he wasn't afraid of contact, and football is a violent sport. Um, he, you know, he had a he had a a self confidence um, in any athletic endeavor that just sort of oozes out of his body. And um, I don't want to jump ahead, but um, he went to uh, a, a, the Carlisle School, a school where, uh, strangely enough, one of the teachers was uh, one of America's greatest 20th century poets, Marianne Moore. Oh, I love that fact. I mean, I, I, you know, in, in, among my research, I went up to the, the Rosenbusch uh, Library in Philadelphia, which has her papers. And... Uh, there was an unfinished manuscript that talked about her times with Jim Thorpe. Um, she was just out of Bryn Mawr College. Um, her family lived in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. And her first job was teaching business um, classes at that school. And Jim Thorpe was among her students. Um, and she loved to go down to the athletic field after class and watch him uh, perform in track and field all of the events, uh, and she would write about it later. If you want to read the quote, I got the quote in front of me. <laughs> uh, I don't have it in front of me. But oh, I just, want to, I just yeah, want to read it. Why don't you because, read it? Yes. Because uh, as you say, she would go down and watch him uh, running hurdles and yeah. uh, taking jumps, taking hammer throws. And this is just, you know, uh, at this point, she's just a random teacher, but she's right. taken up. And as this is much later. She, I think, she boiled down her obs observations and, yes. and and used her poetic um, talents to say that he had a kind of ease in his gait that is hard to describe. Equal equilibrium with no structure, but couched in the lineup of football, he was the epitome of concentration. Wary, with an effect of plenty and reserve. Yeah, well, you can see that in this photo, can't you, Bob? Um, I mean, it's not football, but it's that same uh, 
plenty in reserve, you know, just power that he untapped. He can untap it at any time. Um, yeah, I love that. I, I say in the book that, you know, I read hundreds of uh, descriptions of Jim Thorpe's athletic talents from sports writers over uh, the decades. And I don't think anyone captured it any better than Mary Ann Moore, the, the American poet. I like that people are starting to populate the Q&A with questions and also put them in the chat. We'll get to questions uh, toward the end of this um, uh, session. Um, let's, let's hear from, from David about uh, his book first. Uh, but um, I'm looking forward to, uh, and I'm, I'm sure David's looking forward to taking some of your questions sure. in a little bit. Um, as you mentioned, uh, what was written about him over and over through the book, uh, these uh, even very complimentary observations about uh, Jim Thorpe are clouded with a, a racism, a romanticism of his identity, not seeing him really for who he is, but uh, as this uh, caricature for, the, for them to kind of paint their uh, prejudice onto. Yes. Um, who, who, who also was Jim Thorpe? We're looking at this picture here and he was a member of the Sac and Fox a tribe. He was born in Indian territory of what became Oklahoma, a member of the Sac and Fox tribe. Um, on his father's side, there's a connection to the great Sac and Fox warrior Blackhawk. His mother often told young Jim that he was the reincarnation of Blackhawk. Um, at the time, he was born in 1887 along the uh, banks of the North Canadian River in, in Oklahoma. Um, and the night that he was born, there was a thunderstorm. And um, that's where he got the Sac and Fox name that is the title of my book, Path Lit by Lightning. There was a lightning storm that night. What mo pe most people don't know, if, if they, even if they know about Jim Thorpe, is that he was a twin. He had a twin brother, Charlie who um, sadly died at an early age when they were at the first of the many boarding schools that Jim Thorpe, Indian boarding schools that Jim Thorpe attended during his life, um, the Sac and Fox School. Uh, a, a disease swept through the school and Charlie, Charlie died. Um, so that was the first of many losses in Jim Thorpe's life. But he finally got to Carlisle at age 16. Unbelievably, Bob, when you look at this picture, this is eight years after he got to Carlisle. He got there in 1904, this is 1912. When he got there in, in uh, 1904, he stood five foot five and weighed 115 pounds. <laughs> so he, he had an amazing growth spurt and uh, sort of mature, maturity spurt uh, in those eight years. And Carlisle was the equivalent of a, uh a high school or an early college? It's hard to say, it's, it was neither. It was an industrial school. What the, the most accurate way to put it is, it was a school of forced assimilation. It began in 1879. It was founded by um, a military officer, Richard Henry Pratt, um, who thought he was doing good. Um, but the idea of the school was, actually his motto was kill the Indian, save the man, which meant shear them of their locks, take away their religion, their language, their culture, and as much as possible, assimilate them and turn them into white people. That was the whole notion of it. It was a forced assimilation. The first um, Native Americans who were sent there were young members of the Lakota Sioux um, shortly after or during the period of the, of the Indian Wars or right after that. And they all, these young people thought they were being sent east to die. Um, you know, they were gonna show their bravery by going east to die. And sadly, too many of them did. The, um, the student cemetery, which still exists at what was the Carlisle School, which is now the Army War College, the cemetery is still there. And there are rows of, of a few hundred um, students who died while they were there. And um, the school, for better or worse, um, 
and 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 Jim uh, loved his days there because of this factor, but I think there are complications. The school, so. the, the school used football as a, a promotional tool, a financial tool uh, to attract attention to itself. And um, in, in some ways, Jim benefited. You know, Bob, I'm not sure that he loved the school, but I think that those years, especially the final years from uh, in 1911 and 1912, when he rose to world fame, um, were the best years of his life. And he was at Carlisle during that period. Uh, but yes, football was a tool of assimilation in a sense. Um, the Carlisle, uh, the whole notion was that football was a way to um, assimilate these Native Americans uh, by having them mix with the elite. Um, in that era of football, the great football teams were not Alabama and Oklahoma and LSU, but uh, Harvard and Yale and Princeton and West Point. And those are the teams that Carlisle played and usually beat. But, but here's the great irony. Um, these were young, great young Native American athletes at a school which was trying to rid them of their heritage, their, their Indian uh, exoticism. At the same time, they were playing football and a great attraction at all of these other schools. They, you know, those were the sellout games at Harvard and Penn and Princeton when Carlo came to play um, because, of, because they were exotic. I mean, people came to see them for that reason and they were playing for a school that was trying to take the, the Indianness out of them. One of the greatest upsets in the book uh, is the Army game. And uh, do I get this right? Is, is Eisenhower in, in the game? Oh, yes, he was. Um, Ike was a sophomore. He, he played uh, linebacker and running back. <clears throat> that game was one he would never forget because it was the last football game he played at West Point. Um, before the game, he and one of his teammates they knew that Thorpe, I mean, Thorpe was already an All-American, the greatest player in America. And football was, I mean, football has always been a violent sport, but boy, in those days, it was, you know, there were no holds barred. I mean, you could do virtually anything. So Eisenhower conspired with one of his teammates to try to knock Thorpe out of the game, literally, by hitting him high and low at the same time. Um, they did it in the, early in the second half, Jim was groggy for a while. They didn't knock him out of the game. He got up and shortly thereafter knocked Eisenhower out of the game. And Eisenhower never played another football game. He also fell off a horse a few weeks later, which, which you know, didn't help either. But yeah, that, that game I call the greatest act of athletic retribution <laughs> in American history. You know, the Indians against the Army and the Indians won on a level playing field. They won 27 to six uh, with Jim Thorpe leading the way. Because there is a hard historical context behind his whole life. You mentioned him uh, being uh, born in uh, 1879. It, it, that's the beginning of the Dawes Act. Yes. Uh, and uh, so uh, we're against a background of that kind of assimilation. Uh, it, it, changing the rules. On totally. Animal. I mean, 1887 is when he was born. The Dawes Act was passed that year. Um, what it did was essentially stripped away much of the communal lands of the Native Americans. And as part of the assimilation process, tried to force them into being private landowners like white society. Um, in the process, they also stole a lot of Native land. So, um, you know, I have nothing against the, the people at the University of Oklahoma, but their nickname is uh, Boomer Sooner. And the Boomers were the people who were in the Oklahoma land run of 1891 and, and two, um, who were taking the Indian land. And the Sooners were the ones who cheated and went there too soon. So, you know, it's sort of Boomer Sooner is honoring <laughs> uh, land thieves and their abettors, basically. Um, and that's what Jim saw, you know, at age four and five um, in his native territory. Then, of course, it, 
continued with the, the, the Indian boarding schools, the assimilation, forced assimilation process. And the year he died, 1953, he was 65 years old, was the year when Congress tried to force detribalization, take away all tribes, um, just turn all Native Americans into just regular citizens without any tribal uh, affiliation. Um, so, you know, that whole process sort of benchmarked his life. Uh, let's move on to baseball, although all those sports writers who use uh, the, the language of uh, tomahawks and warpath and all of that stuff, I think reflects um, the, the, the double um, kind of uh, life that uh, Jim Thorpe had to live as uh, a person who loved his uh, ancestry, but had to live in a world where it was mythologized constantly. Um, but uh, in terms of his athletic work in baseball, from the book, it almost seemed like uh, he would have done better if he had uh, been uh, in development longer as a baseball player. I mean, you talked about how incredible a professional football career that was was dominant and a, a professional track and field career. But um, in baseball, uh, you know, it was, was uneven. Was, Okay. Yeah, um, he, wa he was a great, great football player. He was a good, very good baseball player who was mishandled um, by one of the great managers of all time, John McGraw of the New York Giants, who signed him for some questionable reasons. Um, right after he'd lost his gold medals, he became a professional baseball player, which was the one place he could go to actually make money. Um, but McGraw signed him because McGraw was going on a world tour shortly after that, taking the Giants and the White Sox around the world. The rest of the world, you know, they didn't know any of the great baseball players, but everybody knew Jim Thorpe. And so he was the attraction. That's one of the reasons McGraw signed him. But then he really didn't play him much for several years. And Thorpe finally got his real chance in 1919 playing for the Boston Braves, ironically Braves, um, and led the league in hitting almost the entire year, was up there with Babe Ruth and Ty Cobb. Um, he was, you know, he was always fast. He always stole bases. He had some trouble with the curveball, like a many, many great athletes. He was definitely a better baseball player than Michael Jordan, who tried his hand at it once. <laughs> Um, but I think if he had, if he had, yes, if he'd gotten a, to play more um, at a younger age, um, he would have developed much better. Um, and I, I, a lot of baseball historians and my own conclusion was that John McGraw was of no help in that effort. But um, he wasn't as much of a villain as there, there are, I, I counted three legit villains. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, right. there may be more, but yeah, uh, you know, uh, there are definitely villains in this book. Which who 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 are some of the top ones, and maybe that they also intersect with the uh, the gold the gold medal yeah, fiasco. They, yeah, three of them do. Um, you start with Pop Warner. Um, you know, kids today play Pop Warner. Little you know, little kids play Pop Warner football. He's in the pro. He's in the football Hall of Fame. He's one of the iconic names in football. He was the coach of Jim Thorpe at Carlisle in football and in track and field. And after, you know, when Jim Thorpe went off to play summer baseball in the Eastern Carolina League um, for a couple of years, um, that story broke only after he'd won his gold medals. And because he played Bush League baseball, it was said that he wasn't an amateur and his medals were taken away from him. Now, Pop Warner was his coach then. Pop Warner knew exactly what Jim Thorpe had been doing. Um, he had been sending his Indian players to play baseball for years. Um, the the uh, person who scouted Thorpe and got him into the Rocky Mount Railroaders team um, was one of Warner's great friends in Pennsylvania. Um, another coach. 
Um, everything about it, Pop Warner knew. And yet when the story broke, Warner claimed that he knew nothing about it, um, that he was totally innocent. He blamed it on Jim being an, an ignorant Indian, essentially, wrote a fake letter of confession for Jim saying that. So there's number one. You know, Thor Pop Warner at the moment of Jim Thorpe's biggest crisis um, lied about it to save his own reputation. Villain number two, to a somewhat lesser extent, was James E. Sullivan, who you would know as a track guy, was, you know, the, the amateur uh, award every year is, is the Sullivan Award given to the greatest amateur athlete. Um, Sullivan was the head of the American Athletic Union, of the Amateur Athletic Union, and of the American Olympic Committee. But he also was on the board of advisors for the Carlisle Indian Industrial School. He too knew that Thorpe was off playing baseball for those years, and yet he uh, lied about it and said he didn't know. And he and Warner together were the ones who made the decision to send the trophies and medals back um, and to basically strip Jim of all the honors he won at the 1912 Stockholm Olympics. The third villain, and really the arch villain of all time when it comes to amateur sports was Avery Brundage. Um, what fascinated me, Bob, was I didn't realize, you know, I always thought of Brundage as this sort of fat cat, um, Puba, who was the head of the <laughs> International Olympic Committee, um, collecting e Asian art, you know, um, traveling at all the great hotels in, in Europe, um, and sort of smoking cigars and hanging out in, in hotel bars. Turns out he was a decathlete in 1912, competing with and against Jim Thorpe. And he wasn't a very good uh, decathlete. He got clobbered by Thorpe that year. But later, as he rose in power, first as the head of the US Olympic Committee, then as the head of the International Olympic Committee, he consistently denied Thorpe the chance to get those medals back, um, claiming that, that Thorpe had broken amateur rules um, when for so many reasons, what happened to Thorpe was unfair. Um, and I can go through those. I mean, one was that at the time Thorpe was playing minor league, Bush league baseball in the Eastern Carolina League for about a dollar a day or 30 bucks a month, scores of college athletes were doing the same thing. Um, most of them were playing under pseudonyms. Dwight Eisenhower, who we talked about before, played in the Kansas State League under the name Wilson. Um, there were so many pseudonyms in the Eastern Carolina League that they called it the Pocahontas League because everybody was named John Smith. Um, so that's part of it. Another part is um, who was an amateur and who was a professional? Jim Thorpe was being paid for playing baseball, which had nothing to do with the sports in the Olympics that he competed in. Another one of his teammates on that Olympic team was another future general, George S. Patton, who competed in the modern pentathlon, which was a different event than the regular pentathlon. It was all military events, you know, uh, shooting, uh, fencing, equestrian. Um, and he was practicing all of those events while he was in the army, being paid by the army for that. You know, was he a professional or an amateur compared to Jim Thorpe? The entire Swedish national team was given a leave of absence from all of their jobs for six months before the Olympics started at full pay to practice. Were they professionals or amateurs? You know, so, you know, that was another aspect of it that was completely unfair to Jim Thorpe. And finally, the Olympic rules and regulations of that era said that for someone's amateurism to be challenged, it had to be filed within 30 days of the Olympics. The story that said that Thorpe had played minor league baseball came six months later. So even technically, it was wrong what happened to him. And yet for all of those decades, Avery Brundage and the powers that be at the Olympics refused to give him back his, his medals and what he was due. 
it's a fascinating look also at a strand of culture of the Olympics where uh, it was assumed that it was a gentleman's uh, aristocratic uh, oh, endeavor. Totally. And was it was Patton, Patton was uh, from a, uh, a high, um, a high class yeah, background. Was, yeah, he was from a rich family in the San Francisco Bay Area. And, you know, that was the whole notion of Avery Brundage and of the founding of the Olympics. It was basically founded and for rich guys, you know, who could, who could be amateurs because they didn't need the money. Most great athletes are not rich. They come from the working class and the middle class. And they compete not, I mean, of course, they love the sports and they're great at them but they also need the money. It's not, not something they can do you know, in the leisure class, which is what the Olympics and amateurism was all about. Um, let's move on into his life after athletics. Uh, he, uh, he had, it seemed like he had a reinvention at every corner. He uh, got involved with Hollywood movies. He was an advocate for other Native Americans uh, in that industry? I think that period was, was where he found his voice. Um, he struggled a lot um, after his athletic career, as do so many athletes. He all, but he struggled for a lot of different reasons. He, he struggled with alcohol. He struggled with racism. Um, you know, so he had a double whammy there. Um, but in the late 1920s, he ended up in Southern California and found his way into the movie industry at a time when a lot of Westerns were being made. Um, and there were about 200 or so Native Americans who wanted jobs in the movie industry for those movies. And Hollywood was hiring white guys, putting grease paint on them and making them Indians. And so Jim Thorpe, I mean, one of the two arguments he was making um, was, you know, we're real Indians, hire us. And the second was, stop making these movies that denigrate our people. You know, we're, we're always the bad guys. Um, we're always, you know, shown um, saying, you know, ugh and how, and, and, you know, that's not the way we are. We're real people like everyone else. So he's making all of those arguments um, and really finding his voice um, speaking out for his people during that period. But that was just one of many jobs he had. And really, uh, you know, he traveled from, from place to place, I, I chronically living in 20 different states, holding jobs ranging from those Hollywood extras um, to, you know, being a greeter at bars and working briefly for the Chicago Parks Department. Um, traveling around, trying to make his way. He wanted to be a coach. He never really, aside from a brief period when he was a coach in professional football, after that, he, he never got the jobs that he wanted in college football coaching, um, and he struggled. Um, you know, eventually ended up at age 65 after having living with his third wife, um, having seven children while living. Um, his first son, uh, Jim Jr., died, you know, during the 1918 Great Influenza, which was another huge loss in his life. But he had three wives, seven kids, wasn't around much, was living uh, with his third wife in a trailer home in Lomita, California, when he died of a heart attack at age 65. It's frustrating reading that part of the book because every time you think that, yeah. uh, you know, he's got a parks and rec job that's highly paid and he's going to be working with kids, you think this is this is where he lands. But um, there's a restlessness to him. There's yes. the there's the background of alcoholism. Um, and uh, we don't have uh, firsthand knowledge of why so many of those positions just disappeared within weeks. At some time, at some points, you know, I knew the ending, and yet I was as I was researching and writing all of those years, I kept rooting for something better to happen. Um, but in the end, I don't call it a tragedy. Um, I, I view his life as an act of perseverance against the odds. He kept going despite it all, and I think in that sense, his life 
um, sort of symbolized the Native American experience. You know, I write in the book about a statue that was very popular in the mid 19, about 1915, called the End of the Trail, um, which showed a, an Indian warrior slumped on horseback, the horse drooping. And the notion is it's all over for the race, for the native race. Um, and at that point, um, you know, at the turn of the century, uh, the number of Native Americans on the continent had dwindled from many millions down to a little over 200,000. And it looked, you know, with assimilation and with genocide and everything, it looked like maybe that would happen, but it didn't. Um, Native peoples persevered, Indigenous peoples persevered, and now there are a few million. And for you know all of the many troubles that they still face and have, um, there are also a lesson in persevering against the odds, as was Jim Thorpe. Hollywood uh, tells this exciting story. Uh, turns out many times, <laughs> sometimes overtly, and then sometimes covertly. And uh, and so the big one is the Jim Thorpe All American with Burt Lancaster, yeah. which uh, so uh, sold out theaters over and over for uh, a long period. You know, so many uh, people of my generation or a little bit younger say, "Oh yeah, I know about Jim Thorpe. I saw the movie starring Burt Lancaster." <laughs> or the other thing they would say is, "Oh, I read about him in fourth grade." Yeah. Um, so that's their knowledge of Jim Thorpe. The movie. Um, you know, starring Burt Lancaster, who was a great athlete, definitely not indigenous, um, but a very good athlete, had been a, you know, an acrobat, a trapeze artist as a young man, um, and directed by Michael Curtiz, who directed Casablanca, um, and it was a sympathetic movie, so in all those ways, you know, great, but it was also um, inaccurate in every possible respect. Um, ways large and small, you know, small ways ranging from the first scene, you see uh, little Jim Thorpe running back home to a teepee. Well, the second Fox Indians didn't live in teepees, you know. Um, secondly, you see in the background a uh, mountain range. Well, it's the San Gabriel Mountains of California where the movie was shot. You know, there weren't any mountains near where he lived. Um, so those are the small ways, but the large way which gets back to one of our villains, um, is that the narrator of the film is Pop Warner. And the implication of the film, uh, Pop Warner is the white savior. You know, and if only Jim had followed Warner's advice in the later years and more successfully assimilated into white society, he would have been more successful. And, you know, it's, it's a condescending at best attitude that the film conveys from a white perspective. And Warner's taking um, gate receipts and all <laughs> these things throughout. The yeah, and Jim's part. barely getting any money from it, um, <laughs> which of course is a common occurrence in Hollywood. Your, um, some of your other books uh, work as sort of a trilogy um, with this latest one. Uh, you're, you're the author of uh, Clemente, The Passion and Grace of Baseball's Last Hero, and um, When Pride Still Mattered, The Life of uh, Vince Lombardi. What, uh, are there any parallels that you see, or um, uh, what was it like? Yeah, what was it I mean, like? yeah. Uh, first of all, uh, I mean, I, I, when I wrote the first one was Lombardi, then Clemente, then Thorpe. When I started, I didn't say, oh, I'm writing a trilogy. He sort of came to me as I was doing Thorpe, because and, and, or deciding to do Thorpe, because in all of those cases, what I'm looking for is first the drama of sports and a great uh, persona, and you know Vince Lombardi was the great football coach, Roberto Clemente was the beautiful baseball player, Jim Thorpe was the fabulous all-around athlete, but I'm not writing it for those reasons. In each case, I. I wanted to use the drama of sports and the uh, the interest of those characters to illuminate something larger about American history and sociology. So for Lombardi, not just a great football coach, 
but also a chance to uh, write about leadership and even more than that, about the mythology of competition and success in American life. Not only what it takes, but what it costs, which is part of that Lombardi story. For uh, Clemente, not just a chance to write about this great baseball player who, you know, was finished with 3,000 hits, was a, an immediate inductee into the Hall of Fame, um, and the first great Latino ball player, but also that rare athlete who was heroic. You know, so many athletes are called heroes, and really very, very few are. Clemente's motto in life was, if, it, if you have a chance to help others and fail to do so, you're wasting your time on this earth. He lived that motto and he died that motto. I'm trying to deliver humanitarian aid to Nicaragua after the horrendous earthquake there in 1972, um, when he boarded a plane um, that was overloaded, he didn't know it, um, and they had so many other flaws. But he went because he'd heard that the strong man of Nicaragua Anastasio Somoza was diverting the aid. And Clemente said, if I go, it will get to the people. And that's what took him to his death. For Jim Thorpe, the third in the trilogy, not just a chance to write about all of those sports uh, feats that he had, but also a way to um, use his life uh, to illuminate the Native American experience. And as we've said, from birth, from the Dawes Act of 1887 to death, the detribalization, 1953, with all of the uh, horrors of the Indian boarding schools in between. And, um, you know, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois's concept of the double consciousness, though mm -hmm. it's for, um, for Black uh, Americans, might fit in here, where uh, Jim uh, had a, a sense of his own identity and also had to carry a sense of who he was supposed to be. Oh, totally. Absolutely. Um, and struggled with that duality um, his entire life. I will point out one interesting distinction between African Americans and Native Americans, which is that you know both suffered from forms of genocide and horrible discrimination. But Native Americans were romanticized at the same time that they were diminished, whereas African Americans were not. Um, and, you know, Jim Thorpe could play Major League Baseball at a time when there was a color barrier for African Americans. He could go and give speeches in Jackson, Mississippi to the touchdown club when the only blacks there were the waiters, you know, allowed in. So there was that interesting difference of Native Americans totally romanticized but diminished at the same time. And Jim dealt with that his entire life. Well, we've got some good questions in the queue, and I would suggest that any, if anybody has a, a notion for a question, please uh, uh, put it in the hopper. Uh, we'll, we'll get we'll get to those now. Um, let's uh, let's see what. Uh, so we talked about the the tra the the injustice of his medals being um, stripped. Uh, for people who wanted to uh, maintain their own reputation, uh, and were were when were they were they were they ever restored? <laughs> it was a long, hard fight. Um, Jim Thorpe never saw them restored. He died before anything happened. With uh, Avery Brundage consistently denying uh, the efforts to get him his medals restored, but finally. Um, it started in 1983, um, before the 1984 Olympics, there was enough pressure put on um, the Olympic Committee that they sort of half-heartedly gave his children replica medals. Um, so the Olympic medals were sort of given back, but his records weren't restored. You could still look at the record books and not see Jim Thorpe's name. He was completely wiped out from that. And then finally, last year, 110 years too late, mm. everything was restored. Just Every, last year. Just last year. <laughs> you know, um, it took that long for justice to be found for Jim Thorpe. Unbelievable. I um, I have to ask a question that um, I, I, I'm sorry. I, I'm going to 
jump the queue and sure. um he was a generous man um maybe not a conscientious parent or husband but um to even to strangers uh he would uh give money uh, that is part of the explanation. But I got to ask, I'm reading these uh, these these dollar amounts in the 1920s, and I'm putting I'm you know, I'm actually entering them into uh, uh, Google to get the, uh, oh, the interesting. so uh, a season of baseball, thirty five hundred bucks, yeah. uh, you know, maybe 50 to seventy thousand dollars for, you know, a couple of months of baseball in today's dollars. Uh, and yet he is uh, just scraping by year after year. And maybe not at that point. He's keeping his wife in a hotel and, and in, in good stead, but he doesn't, he's not saving any money. No. Where does that kind of money go? Well, it went to uh, his lifestyle to some degree. I mean, he wasn't ostentatious, um, but he also wasn't saving his money. Um, it went to having so many children and trying to keep up with that. Uh, but, you know, I mean, even if you Googled that and found fifty to $70,000, I mean, today he'd be making $240 million, Bob, yeah. you know? <laughs> I mean, it was never enough to really save. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but, you know, he, he would acknowledge that, I mean, he does, you know, in, in many of his speeches that... He wasn't good at saving money. He didn't really care about money. And so many of his associates and friends would say he would give you $200 even if he didn't have it. You know, I mean, he was that kind of guy. Um, money wasn't, wasn't a major thing to him. And he came to sort of regret that in his final years that he hadn't saved more, but he did not. And he and his wife went on these... Um, uh, uh adventures of, of of buying bars and different things and you know they, they were trying to uh build some yeah, kind of that's business. his third wife patsy who was and i don't call her a villain but she was an interesting uh character who was at once sort of trying to get him his due and also manipulating him uh and that's where some of the money went as well his children especially would say that patsy was you know buying things uh, with his money. Um, so, yeah. Uh, one of our uh, uh, Literary Fest uh, uh, committee members, Stephanie, asks, uh, you've written a lot of great books about politics. Are there connections uh, that you've made uh, with the, the, the sports books or with the Thorpe Oh, books? definitely. Yeah. I mean, I you know, I, at the Washington Post, for most of my career, I've been a political writer. I love sports. But here's the thing, you know, one of my, not mentors, but one of, someone who was very helpful to me in my earlier writing was David Al Halberstam, who also wrote about politics and sports. But David would say that he would go to sports as sort of the toy department to release after he'd written a serious book. I, I disagreed with him. I never viewed it that way. I've always thought that, that sports can be um, as sociologically important and revealing of American society and history as anything else. And that politics, a lot of politics can be totally trivial, you know, horse race type of stuff that I don't really care about. So what I'm interested in, I'm interested in character. I'm interested in the tension of lives and how they um, deal with crises. And I'm interested in stories that can illuminate American history and sociology. And that you can, I can, I've been able to find that in sports as much as in politics. So, you know, I've written biographies of Bill Clinton, Barack Obama, and the three figures that I've talked about in sports. And, you know, they, what they have in common, first of all, all, had, all overcame the odds to succeed, you know, in various ways. I mean, Clinton and Obama coming out of nowhere, Clinton from Southwest Arkansas, Barack Obama from Hawaii, you know, further than the American mainland than anywhere could be. And yet they all both made it to the presidency. Um, they all, all the sports figures and the politicians had enormous willpower and a way to figure out how to get around obstacles. Um, and so that's some of the commonalities that I found. 
We've got a great question from Ross, who was asking, um, are there any recordings of Jim Thorpe's uh, speeches uh, addressing the denigration of Native, Native Americans? That is a great question. Um, I found transcripts of some of the speeches. I haven't found recordings. They might be out there. I mean, if I think if a great, you know, um, I'm more interested in uh, the written word. Um, so I'm looking for transcripts. I think that if a great documentarian were out there, you know, they know how to find all of that sort of uh, recording. I, I did find, I did find recordings of Jim Thorpe speaking um, actually at the Library of Congress. Um, they had a few recordings that helped me sort of understand his voice, but those were in interviews. Um, but I didn't find a speech. There's probably one out there, but I didn't find it. He was a retire. He had a retiring voice. He wasn't. He wasn't a loud mouth. If you no. approached him in a bar, he would be very gracious and um, interested in talking with you. But he had a. a, a yeah, a, he was. He was not a. Well, interestingly, white people would say he didn't speak much. Um, some of his uh, teammates uh, at Carlisle <laughs> would say, "Well, you you don't understand. For an Indian, he spoke a lot. You know, to white people more than most of us would." Um, but um, yeah, he had an Oklahoma. Sort of, he, he sounded like you know, uh, uh, Dwight Eisenhower, um, you know, some other Oklahoma, Will Rogers, you know, you could see a little bit of their voice in his voice, uh, that Oklahoma draw. And he had all of these innovations. Uh, people talked about how. Um, he uh, really knew how to break through at, at his size, which is relatively small for a football player, to break through a line like like uh, like nobody's business. And he had all of these innovations. And one moment struck me as he's on the uh, SS Finland, the, the boat over to the Olympics, and somebody, yes. uh, a, a writer, sees him just envisioning how he's going to do the broad jump, uh, and it doesn't even doesn't even practice on the boat. At that point, you know, he was practicing, but uh, this envisioning thing is something that uh, professional athletes do constantly nowadays. But at he that was point, in the vanguard of that in some ways, wasn't he? Yeah, he 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 could um, sort of step out a broad jump or just think about it and not even do it and and just prepare himself for it mentally. Um, and he did that with a lot of different um, of his athletic endeavors. Uh, he was very good at, at first visioning what he would do and then doing it. And one of his teammates, um, A.B. Uh, Kivat, said that that Thorpe was, he could watch someone else do something and then do it better than they did, <laughs> um, which, you know, that was, that was Jim Thorpe. There's another aspect to that, Bob, which I think is important, which is like so many, particularly uh, minority athletes, there was a tendency in the press to say, well, he was just a natural athlete. Yeah. He didn't have to practice. Yeah, right. And, and, you know, that's so wrong and denigrating. And he did practice a lot. Um, he, he refined his abilities by doing that. He also did it mentally, but he certainly practiced physically as well. Dan, Dan asks a good question of, um, where would you look for uh, good videos of, of Thorpe performing sports or, uh, or speaking and different things? Well, you know, there's not much out there. Um, there is a soundless documentary of the 1912 Olympics, um, which was done by a great documentarian, Adrian Wood, at the request of the IOC. Um, where he took all of the old half newsreels and other um, ways that the Olympics were recorded in Sweden um, and modernized them into a two hour documentary, um, which shows a lot of the events. And the interesting thing about it is that the, um, the speed is normalized. So it's not like when you see Babe Ruth, you know, <laughs> Uh, sort of herky jerky running the bases, you feel like you're there. Yeah, there's not enough of Jim Thorpe in the, those because at the time the Swedes were more interested in things like the tug of war and and other events, you know, equestrian. But he, you can see Jim Thorpe in that in that documentary. So, 
Well, David, thank you so much. This has been an incredible um, discussion of Jim Thorpe's life. And I would suggest that everybody go out and um, and get this book uh, from the bookstore, the library, uh, an excellent read. And uh, also I'm excited to delve into some of your other um, uh, books. Um, anything uh, you, you want to uh, finish up on or a last <laughs> parting thoughts? <laughs> Well, I mean, I've really enjoyed this conversation. And, um, you know, when we talked about the 1951 movie, I think there's room for a new one. <laughs> and I think that it might happen. You know, I often say that all of my books are in various stages of not being made into movies. Um, but this one might happen. And if it does, it would be directed by a Native American. And it would be, you know, totally from that perspective. And I think that's great and the way it should be. Thank you so much, David and Bob. Gosh, what an amazing story about an amazing man. Um, our, our next two um, cocktail hours will feature even more amazing authors. On Friday, May 12th, we'll feature award-winning San Francisco-based novelist, Catherine Ma, with her newest book, The Chinese Groove, a story of immigrant immigrant dream, dreams and expectations gone wrong. And on Friday, January 9th, June 9th, we will host um, at 5 p.m. We will host former U.S. Poet Laureate Robert Pinsky with his latest book, which is a memoir about his life as a uh, an American poet, about becoming an American poet. The memoir is called Jersey Breaks. So you can look for information about those two coming up. And um, Thank you again, David. Um, okay, take care. Thank you, everybody. I really enjoyed it, Bob. Thank you. Thank so you, much. David. And thanks yeah. to the audience and the great questions. Okay. Yes, exactly.